Okay, a very good morning to you and welcome to the lecture on precision farming and what is known as precision agriculture or in some contexts it's called smart farming. Okay, what exactly is precision farming and why is it having an advantage over other natural farming systems? To begin with, we have to start looking at the conventional way of farming and how that conventional way of farming impacts the agricultural productivity on a global scale. Okay, so in this lecture, we are going to focus on uh, precision agriculture, primarily because we have to incorporate an entrepreneurial element into your course. And in precision agriculture, a lot of the components or the principles of plant molecular biology applied to improve plant productivity. I'll give you an example. For instance, if you want to test the efficiency of fertilizers on plant productivity, you can do a molecular analysis by analyzing the transcriptome in response to a specific fertilizer input. You can provide it with nitrogen and test the transcriptomic response. Are the genes regulated, upregulated by nitrogen, or are they downregulated? Similarly, you can do it for almost all of the elements which are used for agri agronomic practices. So that is why the molecular biology element comes into precision agriculture. The element also incorporates lighting, for instance, different types of light uh, qualities, wavelengths and intensities can have different impacts on plant productivity. This is why uh, molecular biology plays a very important role when developing precision agriculture systems. However, you have to also know about the terminology of precision agriculture. There are certain terms and different kinds of systems which you should be aware of. So this lecture will focus primarily on those systems which are utilized in precision agriculture and what is known as precision farming, also called smart farming. Okay, the, the objectives of today's lecture are to introduce you to the fundamental principles of precision agriculture, to highlight specific applications of molecular techniques and to provide a theoretical background for the design and development of platforms for precision agriculture. So this is your learning outcome. You have only one learning outcome, which is upon completion of this lecture module, you should be able to demonstrate the ability to design and to develop a facility for the precision agriculture of commercial crops. So for instance, if you are asked to design and develop a facility, you should be able to decide on the facility design by uh, design, I refer to not only the shape of the building and the size of the building, it refers to the engineering elements in that building. This is the lighting, the ventilation system or the carbon dioxide management system, the fertilizer management system, and also all the parameters which are related to the management of the fertigation systems. Okay, let us look back at conventional agriculture and why the limits of conventional agriculture are being felt in today's world. Yeah, I will give you an example using uh, graphical representations of the situation so that it's better for you to understand. Now, if you look at the world in general, we have about 29% of terrestrial area, which is the land mass, and the remaining 71% is approximately, 70% is all water, that is the oceans. 29% also encompasses the polar ice caps as well as the internal water bodies such as lakes and other internal rivers and all those elements. Now, only 50% of the land mass which is available to us is utilized for agriculture, which means that out of that 29% which is available to us on a terrestrial level, which is the Earth, what we call the uh, terrestrial part of the planet, only 15% of that is utilized for agriculture. The remaining is utilized for, or it is covered with natural forests, or only 1% is utilized for urban cities. You'll be surprised that although we see cities all over the world and in all, all over, I mean, you see it as overpopulation, only 1% is actually utilized for the urban, what we call the urban built up areas. Okay. Now, among that, 50% uh, what is actually available for agriculture. Cattle production 
is uh, is contributing to 36 percent. So what what this means is that 36 percent of the agricultural land which we can use for other crops is utilized to produce forage for cattle. This includes the grass, sorghum, and all other forage crops for cattle. So that's a large amount. And cattle is basically we. Uh, harvest the meat from cattle we slaughter cattle and we harvest the meat from cattle so you can imagine the amount of uh, the vegetable content or the plant content which is utilized for the production of meat so for every kilogram of uh, wheat or, uh, or soya which is fed to cattle you'll only get about 400 to 500 grams of meat so that means there's a conversion ratio so eating meat is actually uh, good for health but it's unhealthy for the planet in general Okay, so the remaining area which is used for food crops is only 13.4 percent. So this shows you that the land available for agriculture is actually dwindling. So we have two solutions available to us. One is to reduce the amount of cattle in the world. So you see, Brazil is the one of the largest producers of meat in the world. So they have cut a large area of their rainforest to just to produce soybean and other forage for their cattle. So one of the solution is to reduce the consumption of meat. Although many people may not like that because meat is a staple food for many people, it's a source of protein. So the other solution is to uh, go back to, into smart farming and utilize whatever we have more efficiently. Okay, this is a representation of that in the graphical what I've just spoken to you about. Okay, now what is happening in the world is the population is expanding. So the population is expanding. However, you can see in this graph, the blue part is the expanding population, and then the purple graph represents the fertility rate. So, as the population expands, the fertility rate or the the number of individuals being born actually reduces, and this can be seen in populations such as China, uh, in uh, Japan. Actually, China also is facing the problem. In Japan, we have a largely aging population because younger people. As they urbanize and they have more uh, financial burden, they do not want to have kids because it adds to the uh, strain on the budget. So, fewer children in the world, which means that the production or the fertility rate will actually reduce. However, the uh, there'll be a plateauing of the world population after a while because the number of old people are increasing and the number of young people will reduce. So, this is the uh, paradox of the world. In fact, if you refer to Elon Musk, he has said that the biggest population to the biggest uh, challenge to humanity is actually population decline, because maybe in under hundred years from now, our population will be reduced so much so that it will be unproductive. The planet, so we need a certain amount of people in the world to actually keep the planet moving. If we're not, we will have a reduction in the net yield of the planet in terms of the output. Okay, so. This is one of the challenges faced by the modern uh, the modern sociologists and the socio-economists. Okay. We also have problems from the um, agriculture itself. For example, one of the biggest problems faced in Malaysia is the runoff from the effluent from the palm oil industry. So you have effluent coming from the palm oil plantations, which is in the form of the nitrogen and phosphorus, which Enters the water systems as well as the pollution from the processing of the agricultural product into value-added resources, which is the, uh, the this is the PKC, the palm kernel uh, cake, and other elements of the palm oil industry. Now, what's happening is that all of this pollution is actually not uh, not something which is bad. A lot of it is phosphorus. Okay. Phosphorus enters the ecosystem in the water bodies and the streams and the lakes and rivers, and that causes eutrophication. And eutrophication results in the death of fish. Now, if you look at phosphorus itself, there is actually a phosphorus limitation in the world, which means that we have limited quantities of gold, silver, and all those precious elements. But there is also a limitation of phosphorus. And if we do not conserve our phosphorus, by the year 2060, we will have a loss or a complete depletion of phosphorus. Phosphorus will become so valuable that you'll have to extract it or recycle it from other sources. So phosphorus is one of the elements which we are wasting now through fertilizer, but it's also one of the elements which is required in order 
to ensure sustainability of agriculture. So currently, I think most of the phosphorus is based on what I've read is imported from China. So China has a control over the phosphorus, uh, the mining industry, phosphate. Phosphate is actually mined from the soil, certain mines. So we'll have a limitation of phosphorus. So this is one uh, aspect which can be prevented by um, using smart farming approaches. Okay, we also have a problem with uh, with the cropping cycle, which is something known as the diminishing returns. Now, let's look at Malaysia itself. Okay, in Malaysia, if you look at palm oil, the current yield per hectare is around 18 tons, which means we, for every hectare of land, 10,000 square meters, you get about 18 tons. Indonesia is somewhere along the same. This is because of the improvements in the uh, production of the uh, palm oil seedlings. So now we have hybrids and we also have the uh, sclonal uh, lines. So there's an increase in the production. However, if you go to see on a global scale, the highest, the most productivity is in Central America. So countries such as Nicaragua, Venezuela, they have actually gone up to the production levels of around 30 to 40 tons per hectare. So they're actually uh, using some technologies. It may be either in the form of improved germplasm or some other technologies which are resulting in an increase in the yield. So that's why uh, we have to play the catch up game with them as well. But what is very evident in the uh, cropping cycle or the uh, diminishing returns is rice. Okay, uh, Malaysia currently produces an average of 2.5 tons of rice per hectare. That's whereas New Zealand produces eight tons in the same one hectare. Okay, now if you see New Zealand, the climate is not conducive to rice farming. It is actually on somewhere in the southern hemisphere on the temperate zones. So how they have achieved that is by using modern agronomic practices. They have utilized different technologies to increase the production of rice. But Malaysia has the capacity to produce up to 5.4 tons. That's about almost five tons, five to six tons per hectare. So that means there is a gap between what is actually produced and what can be produced. And this may be due to the agronomic practices or the underutilization of the land. For instance, if you see during the pandemic, there's a the food security is a major issue because if farmers get sick, they cannot produce food. Now we are also experienced the same situation about in 2006. In 2006, due to the El Nino effect, there was a production decline in rice in Philippines, Vietnam, Thailand, Indonesia. So they stop export of their rice. And Malaysia is a major importer of rice. So that creates uh, pressure on the government to increase production at the national level. So this is one of the reasons why uh, diminishing returns is an issue. So we must utilize the available land more efficiently. So this is not only observed in Malaysia, it's across the world where you have certain crops in which production has basically stagnated or become static, which means that there's no further chance for improvement. So you either have to go for GMO or you go for smart farming. And the other aspect is logistics. Now, if you see Sabah, for instance, just we don't look very far away, look at Sabah itself. The production of all the vegetable is in the highlands, which is in Tambunan area also in the Kundasang area. Now for that vegetable to reach KK, it has to go through the road transport. So that utilizes a lot of energy. Also there's spoilage. And now in the pandemic time, there's also the lockdown. So you have problem to cross over. The same case is happening in Semananjung, in which case you have the farmers from Cameroon Highlands actually dumping their, their vegetable. They are, they are throwing away vegetable now because there is no consumer. They cannot ship it to the city. So this is creating a big problem in the pandemic era, uh, it was creating a problem earlier as well. So now in West Malaysia, certain companies such as City Farms, there's a company there, has actually started a farm in the middle of the city. So they overcome the transportation and logistics aspect by producing the crops in the city itself, okay, in a vertical farming system. So these are things which are driving us to smart farming. It's just that we don't have sufficient land sufficient resources and sufficient uh, scales in order to produce scales, refer to the economics of scale to produce crops very far away and ship them to other countries. So 
if you see in Malaysia only, the, the rice is actually shipped in from Indonesia, Thailand, and other countries. Okay, So we are importing rice, even though it can be produced here locally. So I think the pandemic will definitely uh, help or require us to relook at the logistics of production. So all of these factors have led us to a shift to precision agriculture. So it's the you will find articles, if you read about this online, you'll, you'll refer to it as smart farming, precision agriculture, or precision farming. All of them are basically relating to the same uh, concept. Now, in precision agriculture, which is being practiced on a very large scale externally, that's in the field, different technologies are used for precision farming. These include the GIS, the global information systems, as well as satellite tracking. For example, China no longer uses um, uh, human uh, labor to actually go and check for pests and diseases. The testing for pests and diseases is done using drone or autonomous technology. They will have a camera which will pick up the uh, images of the farm and they will use artificial intelligence to identify based on the leaf color the uh, fertilizer levels as well as the level of the nitrogen and other components in the soil. They can also identify pests purely by looking at the infrared signature from the crops. So that is how high it, uh, level it has reached in the uh, developed countries. So China is, the, uh, is advancing in the drone technology for agriculture. Okay, almost all across the world, even the uh, farm, uh, the tractors in the US and the UK and the European Union countries, they are all autonomous. So you don't have anybody sitting in the tractor. It's controlled by robotics, just as you have the autonomous cars. So the primary reason for this is they don't want to use labor because labor is prone to fatigue and also error. And it's also very costly. So the advantages of precision agriculture are evident from the practices which are being adopted in other countries. So the first advantage is high density. High density refers to the number of plants which can be grown per square meter or the square uh, hectare of acreage. Okay? So in traditional systems, we use soil. Now, in order for the plant to grow, it has to expand its roots through the soil. So you can't do high density planting in, in a traditional agricultural industry. For instance, in tomato farm, if you go to Kundasang, they can only plant around 20 to 40,000 plants per hectare. So that's about two to four plants per square meter. If they exceed that, the cost uh, or the, uh, pr the operation becomes inefficient. The second aspect is the uh, pesticide. So in a precision farming uh, environment, the production is done in a enclosed greenhouse so there's a limitation in the amount of pesticides so if you use less pesticides your consumers gets less pollution and you also pollute the environment far less as when you do it in open system you have minimum pollution because in precision agriculture you use very expensive fertilizer so you don't waste you measure it in terms of the grams in fact in precision agriculture we use only about two grams per liter of water for an entire cycle that's a very low um, amount of fertilizer which is used because if you use a higher concentration, it's expensive. Okay, just to give you an example, if you go to KK and buy the fertilizer for precision agriculture, a bag of around 20 kgs will cost you around 250 to 350 ringgit Malaysia based on the, uh, based on the uh, type of fertilizer, whether you're nitrogen or phosphorus fertilizer. A bag of fertilizer of a uh, normal fertilizer of that same size will cost you only about 25 to 30 ringgit Malaysia. So the cost is very high, but the efficiency of the fertilizer also is also very high. If you have to use uh, 500 grams per plant of the conventional fertilizer, in the case of the uh, precision farming fertilizer, which is known as crystalline fertilizer, we use only about 20 to 30 grams per plant for the whole life cycle. So you can imagine how much reduction in the uh, the amount is there. So that results in less pollution. Logistics is, as I explained, most precision farms are located in the city. The carbon footprint is low, which means that their precision farms do not use a large amount of the 
carbon in terms of the electricity. They don't consume. Whereas in a conventional farm, you have to have tractors for growing. You have to have uh, different um, electrical pumps and things like that. So in precision farming, the amount of electricity used is very low. So you have a lower carbon footprint. And then you have the most important aspect of precision farming is automation and artificial intelligence. OK, I'll give you a very uh, simple example of density, high density uh, culture. OK, so the most common example we use is tomatoes because tomatoes are very easy to quantify in terms of their yield and they are grown across the world. So if you look at tomato cultivation in Southeast Asia, you get about 20 tons. OK, but what can be actually got is around 40 tons per hectare. So currently, if you look at the uh, the uh, cost of tomato in the market. If you see in Sabah, there is actually a website. You will have a website from the uh, farmer, the F uh, Federation of Agricultural Producers. So you have a uh, harga there. So you'll have the harga, the ladang, which is the lowest price. You have the harga borong, which is the wholesale price, and the harga runchit. So you have three different prices. So if you look at the harga uh, ladang, which is if you went to the farm directly and collected one ton of tomatoes, the price now is only around 50 cents. One ringgit to one ringgit, 50 cent. OK, so that's, that's the price in the uh, Ladang. OK, so if you go at the Borang, of course, it increases by a certain factor. And of course, in the Runchit, it will go up again. So that means if you are paying around uh, six ringgit, 50 cent in the uh, market for the tomato, they are actually buying it at only 50 cent or one ringgit. But when they are buying it from the farmer in what they call the Ladang, they are actually buying it in bulk. So they will buy a bulk of tomatoes, maybe two ton, three ton. So they'll buy. Now, the, this is actually affecting the profit of the farmer because if they sell the tomatoes at so low price, the the actual profit to the farmer is very very low. So they can't actually use uh, high tech stuff in the conventional farm. Now, if you look at the uh, production in Western countries like European Union countries such as Sweden, Finland. Uh, in the UK, Netherlands, they go up to 80 to 240 tons per hectare. So you can imagine the uh, factor which is going up. So in, in uh, for example, in Kundasang, you'll get about 20 tons. In If you go to the Sweden, Finland, and uh, Norway, that's, those are the Scandinavian country, they produce about 240 tons per hectare. So you can imagine the productivity increase. Okay, So that means it's about 20 to 45 kgs of tomato per square meter, which means that if you had just one square meter of a, a smart farm in your house, you don't have to go to the market anymore because you'll produce about 20 to 45 kgs of tomato per square meter per year. So that's the quantum of increase in tomato production simply by using advanced technologies. The seeds are almost the same because they're hybrid seeds. But what they have done is they have used advanced technologies by understanding the behavior of the plant in terms of the productivity. So they understand the growing aspects of the plant, what is known as the growth characteristics of the plant, and they apply the changes based on that. Okay, So surprisingly, the highest yield of tomatoes is in Scandinavian countries. If you know what's, uh, if you look at the map, you will see that the Scandinavian countries are located far to the north, almost in the North Pole, where there's a very low amount of sunlight but they still produce 240 tons. And we, with our high sunlight in Southeast Asia, can only produce a record of maybe 40 tons in the open environment. So you can see the implications of smart farming in terms of the productivity. OK, now, in smart farms, almost no pesticide is used because the farm is actually contained. Okay, If you have a pesticide infection uh, infestation in your farm, or a pest began to infest your farm, you will have a big problem because you'll have to uh, shut down the whole operation and fumigate. Okay, So you have to ensure that no pests come inside because you can't use pesticides inside as you'll uh, basically go against your organic or your label for the farm. So no pesticides because they are tested, then you lose your certification. So what is done in the uh, precision farming systems or in the greenhouses is that biological control I use. One of the most common biological control is the trichogramma wasp. You know, this trichogramma is a very small wasp. As you know, wasps are predators. So if you have wasps and bees, wasps will attack bees' hives and they will kill the larvae and they'll consume it because they are carnivorous. So 
that's what happens in nature now this is not a dangerous wasp it won't uh, sting you however it's very very small what it does it feeds on eggs of insects now if these wasps are released into your greenhouse they will not cause any problems for your plants they will eat the eggs of the insects as well as the larvae so they will reduce they are very good biological control and they are very small they are few millimeters so you don't see them and they don't harm your crops so this is the way in which uh, precision farmers manage their systems and the pollution is minimum because there is no agriculture runoff nothing which is produced in a precision farm in terms of the fertilizer gets wasted as i explained to you the cost is very high and no fertilizer is actually uh, released out of the farm it's recycled and the uh, pesticide as well is not released from the farms okay now logistics most of the precision farms are located within the city itself so if you go to some countries they will have even like a skyscrapers like a tall buildings with precision farms located at different levels now this is all based on the government policies for example in some countries governments favor the establishment of precision farms in the city itself so singapore is one example because singapore has almost no land used for agriculture so they are resorting to precision farming for the production of their crops and singapore although it's the smallest country in the world i mean in terms of size the self sufficiency index is very high which means that singapore is more self sufficient than a larger country uh, which will produce its own food supply because they go in for precision farming they produce enough to feed their population using this method so they have the potential to produce enough food for their population so that's called self sufficiency or the self reliance is high in a technology clearly advanced society so the other aspect of logistics is what is on a just in time production which means that if you can have an app on your phone like what is being done in kl and city farm so you have this app and then you'll say you'll tell a company i need uh, 10 kgs of lettuce for my restaurant every day okay place a pre order when the when the factory or the precision farming factory receives this notification they will plant that many uh, plants to produce 10 kg in advance and they'll give you a discount so you can book your uh, crops in advance so it all, you have almost no wastage so this is one of the advantages of precision farming normally what you will do for a restaurant uh, they will go to the market in the morning the wholesale and they'll buy vegetables in bulk and then most of it gets uh, wasted when you transport it or you don't have enough customers you throw away the vegetable in a precision farming setup you reduce wastage to almost nothing because you have a control over the production cycle so the consumer decides how much you want to grow so you can set up a precision farm in your house or in your backyard with uh, maybe even 50 square meters or less than 50 square meters and you can supply the market in fact this is being done in kl where you have city farms which produces the kit for production of the uh, the uh, plants in using the uh, precision farming system but you don't have to use their system you can actually develop it yourself you can diy these systems because all the components are available in the hardware shops okay, so you can do this yourself and then you reduce the transportation cost so if your customer is for example example offering only uh, asking only for 10 kg or 20 kg you can just deliver it with with your vehicle or with a courier service so this is why it's becoming more and more efficient as time goes by so this is the major reason why precision farming is cited mostly in the city and the carbon footprint is very low so now in a conventional farming system you are shipping the farm the crops across large distances for instance you are shipping the farm produce from kundasang to kk and then you are using a truck you are producing more carbon dioxide so if you produce in the city you will definitely reduce the carbon footprint okay in fact uh, if you look at a larger scale if you go to the supermarket you'll find grapes from egypt and dates from middle east and almonds from usa and and so on and so forth so those crops have actually been sh uh, shipped all the way from Uh, foreign countries to this uh, to saba so you can imagine the amount of the carbon which is used for the transport in terms of the shipping 
the logistics, the freight. So this one, uh, this aspect of precision farming is based on the reduction of the carbon footprint. In fact, Singapore invests a lot of money in precision farming. They, the budget for precision farming is about uh, 200 million Singapore dollars per year for startups. Now, in the Singapore ecosystem, startup ecosystem, they give seed money for setting up a precision farm because setting up precision farming systems is not cheap. You have to buy sensors, you have to buy lights, you have to buy pumps, and you have to buy the tanks and the fertigation systems. All of this is not cheap. If you did it yourself, of course, it'll be cheap. But when you do it on an industrial scale, if you want to scale up, for example, the whole Kilang, one factory of one acre, you can't do it individually. You have to employ the consultant, and they will build it for you, and so on. So that's costly. Now, if you wanted to set up your own precision farm in, for example, in your house in in Malaysia, the cost may be ranging between 20,000 to 30,000 ringgit for about a 100 square meter operation. So that's the cost of the setting up of the farm itself, not the cost of the land. Now, that's why when you do the precision farming, you have to establish a good business model. You can't just say, I'm going to invest 10,000, but you need to see whether your uh, profit is there in the, in the crops. Okay, I will explain to you some of the crops later, uh, which can be, if you all are interested in precision farming, you can definitely ask me or Dr. Wilson, and we will help you in your precision farming. It's part of our uh, CSR or social initiative to facilitate entrepreneurship among students. So if you need any help, we will help you uh, pro bono. So we are not going to charge anything for that. We will help you with the initial uh, setup and things like that, how, how to set up stuff. OK, now, when we want to develop, for instance, look at it from the perspective of yourself. If you want to go into the precision farming industry, if you want to start it up, we, we have to develop a system. Now, that system cannot be copied. We cannot go to KL or go to Singapore or go to Netherlands and say, oh, you have a system here. We want to copy it in Sabah or in West Malaysia. You can't do that because the system has to be adapted based on the localized requirements. So this can be in the form of the uh, temperature. Climatic conditions are different. The solar radiation is different. And the uh, requirements in terms of logistics, for example, look at it practically. If you're trying to buy the fertilizer in Sabah, the cost will be about 30 to 40 percent higher as compared to Semenanjo because of the shipping cost and things like that. So you have to take those into account before you develop a system for precision farming. OK, so in order to do this, we have to start up with a design strategy. So design strategy refers to the setting up of the system on paper before you actually carry out the implementation of the factory. So you need to calculate the cost, costing, and the other factors before you develop your actual plan. Okay. Now take, for example, now if you see in Sabah, the, the crop which was in high demand is actually the chili. So you have chili plants. So when the chili uh, crops are being developed, everyone uh, says, oh, there's a high amount of profitability in chili. So they're all going for chili farming. So what happens? The supply increases, the demand drops, and then the price crashes, and then it's no longer viable. So you have a baseline price of 30 to 35 ringgit Malaysia, and then it drops to around 15 ringgit Malaysia. So it's no longer viable. So these are factors which you should take into consideration when building a precision farm. What are the type of crops you will use? Uh, what is the profitability in the market? Are those viable? Can they be sold locally? Can you preserve them? Or can you ship them to other locations? And that is one of the other advantages now, because precision farming is using almost zero pesticide. You can always ship these crops to other countries. Okay, I'll give you an example. Many years ago in Sabah, the vegetables used to be exported to Brunei from, from Kundasang. But later on, what was found out in the Brunei, they found out that there is a high amount of pesticides. Singapore as well, because you can air freight vegetable from Sabah to Singapore. There's a direct flight. However, again, the issue of the pesticides came up. So that is why uh, Brunei stopped for a while. They were stopped the uh, uh, import of vegetables because of they could not meet their criteria for import. Now, if you use precision farming, obviously you use no fertilizer, no chemicals, or no chemical fertilizers which will carry residues or no pesticides. So this, in turn, 
will improve your market value of your product. So these are things which you should think about before you start producing the uh, vegetables or any products in precision form. There are also what are known as high value crops, such as the herbs. Okay, herbs can be produced in precision farming systems at very high efficiency. Now, if you look at the strategic position of Sabah, it's basically very good because from Sabah, the market is Singapore. It's connected by uh, the hub. You have a, a, earlier there were flights now. I don't know whether they restart, but that's a very good transit point because you can always ship to uh, Singapore where they don't have land to grow. So you can always ship between these two countries as well as the markets from overseas, such as the Korean market, which also has flights. Of course, Korea is much more advanced in uh, precision farming, but certain crops or certain seasons of the year, they can't grow stuff over there. Like for example, in winter, they have to their productivity goes down. So that's the time when you export. Okay, this is uh, things. That, that's why when you develop this farm, you have to not only really look at the farm itself, you have to look at your market. For example, if you see the uh, in European Union, the flower market. There's a very big flower market in Netherlands. They import flowers from Africa. Why they do that is because when, when it's summer in Africa, it's almost their sun throughout the year. In European countries, it's winter. They cannot grow flowers in winter because there's snow. So they import the flowers from Africa to reduce the cost. Okay, so these things are all part of your overall design strategy. Okay, now what is the business model? So when we look at the conventional farmer, what I will do, I will go and buy seeds and I will make a estimation of course, I will kira how much for the seeds. I paid like 2000 ringgit, okay, for my seeds, F1 hybrid seeds for one hectare. Then I put my fertilizer costs, my pesticide, my labor, etc., etc. And I do a, a, just a calculation and I say, oh, it costs me so much for producing so many tomatoes. And then I say, this is my output. This is how much the uh, supplier will pay me, uh, the buyer. And then I do a costing. So if you go to see in Kundasang, if you do a overall study, there is a very low profit margin in agriculture. And that's why many of the youth turn away from agriculture because the profitability is very low. When you, uh, I'm telling you the practical aspect of it because I have many um, friends who are actually in farming in different parts of the world. They just make enough money to get by. It means they have enough money to buy your inputs, your fertilizer, your seeds, everything, and you ha may have a little bit of money left over. So farming is not profitable in the current world. Now, or the current economic system as we see it. So in order to do precision farming, you can't take that risk because in a conventional farming, you have your uh, you have your place, you have your ladang, right? So it probably is inherited from your parents, so it's leased out, so it's very low cost. But in the case of precision farming, you can't take a risk because you're investing money in the construction of your infrastructure. So you have to do a basic input-output calculation. So the input for precision farming or in any farming operation is the light, because light is the major input, CO2 and the fertilizers, as well as the labor. But in precision farming, uh, for instance, in the Netherlands, one farm utilizes only two people for one hectare. You see, if we did the same farming in Sabah using the open farm, you'll have to employ about 10 to 20 people per hectare to do your cropping, your harvesting. During harvesting, you have to get more Labor, so labor is very labor intensive. In precision farming, there's just two people. For instance, in Japan, there's a big precision farm. They only employ three to four people to manage the whole farm. So the farm, the manager will not enter the farm unless there is a need to actually go in. So that's the input cost. And the output, of course, is the financial return on your crop. Okay, so the most important part or the first part of the precision farm is the greenhouse. Now. In, their lecture, in this lecture, I will not go into the design of the greenhouse and the type of the purlins and use. I will look at certain parts of the greenhouse or certain design constraints in the greenhouse, which we need to be aware of. So the first one is to orient the greenhouse. Okay, orientation refers to the position along the north-south axis. The second part is the uh, location of the greenhouse. So of course, you, have, you won't locate a greenhouse in a place where there's flooding or whether there's earthquakes and things of that nature, or landslide. In Kundasang, you have a lot of landslides, so you have to identify the proper location. The control of temperature is very important because plants prefer to have cooler temperatures at night. Many times people wonder why 
the plants which are grown in highlands are more tasty as compared to the plants grown in the lowlands. For example, the fruits from those plants, the tomatoes are more tastier. This is because of the biochemistry of the carbon cycle, or the fixation and conversion to sugar. Plants prefer daylight temperatures which are warmer. So you have uh, daylights, for example, in the daytime, a warmer temperature. However, the night temperature should be cooler because during the night, cool nights, sugar is synthesized. So that results in the higher concentration of sugar in the fruit or the tomato or the strawberry. So if you take that same strawberry plant planted in KK, where the temperature is almost constant throughout the day and night, you will have less sugar production, less biosynthesis. Whereas if you took that same plant to Kundasang, where the night temperature is cooler as compared to the day. So you'll have Kundasang maybe 20, 16 to 20 in the day and maybe 4 to 8 in the night. So the lower temperature in the night, the cooler climate will result in an increase in the sugar production. So this is all where molecular biology comes in because you can understand the temperature and the effect on the uh, amount of sugar in the plant. There's also a very important aspect in the greenhouse, which is carbon dioxide. I'll explain to you why carbon dioxide is utilized later. So carbon dioxide is actually a food for the plant. It's just like feeding fertilizer. Okay, just as you feed a plant with fertilizer NPK, nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus, carbon dioxide is a fertilizer in itself. And the last element is insect proofing. So in greenhouses, you have multiple types of designs. One is the partially open design in which you have insect screen. So the air flows in and flows out, but you won't have insects going in. Or you have completely contained greenhouses like the one which you have in IPV. Those are very expensive to build because you need to invest in all those glass and the structural element. So the cost of the greenhouse is based on the final uh, profitability. In Singapore and Japan, they have greenhouses which are built in containers and they have artificial lighting. Now, these are pro producing plants for the restaurant industry, the herbs. For example, in, in Japan, you have the sushi. So for sushi, they require certain plants which are completely clean. No pesticide is there because they eat the plants raw. So those plants are produced in the greenhouse. But you see the final cost of that plant produced in the greenhouse may be about 30 to 40 US dollar per kg. Okay, no one will buy that plant if you sell it here because that it, the cost is too high. So that product cost will be too high. For example, in Japan, they use uh, certain uh, plants for seasoning the sushi, so the fish. So those plants, the herbs, the cost of the herbs is very high. So they can do that in contained greenhouses. So all these factors must be taken into consideration when designing a greenhouse. OK, now the orientation of the greenhouse is basically done on a north-south axis. So the length of the greenhouse, this is actually the plan, how it looks from the top, the plan view. So the Orientation should be on a north-south axis. This is because of the sunlight is used the most efficiently in this axis. So if you look, if you look in the field, look on Google Earth and you zoom in, you will see greenhouses. They will always be oriented north-south, unless they are artificially lighted, in which case they don't care much about the orientation. But if you're using solar greenhouses, the north-south orientation is very important. Also, the plants which are grown inside don't create a shadow on their member plant. So suppose we had made this in a east-west orientation, the shadow of the plants on this side will actually cross over onto the other side. So this is the plan layout. So they utilize the full range of the solar radiation. Okay, so this is an example of a greenhouse. I just showed it to you to show you the amount of structural elements which go into the greenhouse. So this is the cost. The cost is the structure itself. Okay, now in greenhouses, we have two types of systems which are used for lighting. So in the case of the uh, natural light, we have to use the north-south orientation, which means that you have the sunlight traversing across. If you're using artificial lighting, you don't have to use or take into consideration anything with regard to the solar energy or the solar, uh, solar tracking because there is no utilization of solar energy, unless you're using solar panels to light up your greenhouse. But let us look at the costing for the lighting. Okay, now suppose you produce plants using solar energy and the plants using the artificial lighting, the cost will be 
remarkably or significantly different. Now, where is this lighting used? In Sabah, we don't need to use artificial lighting at all because we have natural light. But however, when you go to the European countries, the North countries, for example, if you go to Sweden, Norway, and Finland, they have a time in the year, like six months of the year, when you have partial light. Okay, So you have about during December, uh, November, December, and January, you will have almost no sun there. So they'll have a dark darkness because above the Arctic Circle. So in that case, you have to use artificial lighting. So in European countries as well, the sunlight reduces during winter. In tropical countries, we don't have to use artificial lighting. However, countries like Singapore do have greenhouses with artificial lighting because they want to grow everything in layers. Okay, So suppose you go build a greenhouse with shelf, the shelf system, the top shelf will prevent the light from going from the sunlight from going onto the lower shelf. So the lower shelves will have to be lighted with artificial lighting. Now, when we talk about lighting, we always look at lumens per watt. Lumens per watt is the light intensity. Okay? When you buy a monitor, you buy a camera, you have to see the lumens per watt, which means that how many lumens or how much light do you get for every watt of energy you put into the system. Now, sunlight, if you go outside in the sun and if you take a light meter and you measure, you will see the sunlight is about 93 lumens are present in one watt of sunlight. Okay? You can convert it from using the meter. Then you get about 45 lumens per watt from the most efficient form of lighting, which is the LED lighting. So I'll give you the calculation in the next slide. Okay. So if you sunlight, okay, natural sunlight, suppose you went out in the sun and you want to grow plants, you get 93,000 lumens per square meter. Okay, so you get one about one kilo. Uh, uh, that's the lighting. Now suppose you want to replace the sun with lights, LED light. LED is the most efficient light. The white light which is being sold now, or almost all over, lamps have been replaced with the light emitting diodes or LEDs. You will have to buy a LED with a wattage of about two thousand watts. Okay, two kilowatt, which means you have to spend about if you see the cost of uh, LED is about one ringgit Malaysia per watt. Okay, if you go to the shop, electrical shop just the normal shop you'll, you'll find. So if you want to buy a 2000 watt LED equivalent to 2000 watts, you'll have to spend about 2000 ringgit Malaysia for the cost of the same amount of light from the sun. Okay, That's just for one square meter. So if your greenhouse is 100 square meters, you can imagine how much the cost will be. Okay, So I did a calculation for you. So if you utilize artificial lighting as compared to sun in your greenhouse, your cost of the for, for 500 square meter greenhouse. Okay, I did a calculation using the SASP rate, which is the 50 cent per kilowatt hour. That's the commercial rate of SASP. So if you did a greenhouse, if you want to grow tomatoes for two cycles, which is 200 days, you'll have to spend your electric bill will be 1.2 million ringgit Malaysia. So you'll have RM 1.2 million in your cost of electricity. You can do the math. So it, Two kilowatt per square meter, and then you multiply it by the number of watts, which is one thousand kilowatts for five hundred square meters, and you do your calculation for the electricity, and then you'll have around one point two million ringgit Malaysia per five hundred square meter greenhouse. So that's a huge amount of money. So if you produce tomatoes in that greenhouse, your cost of the tomato may exceed. You divide one point uh, like around. Uh, a thousand kilograms, so you'll have you pay almost one thousand ringgit per kilogram of tomato. So that's exorbitant. So this is why we need to use solar energy. Okay. So this lighting calculation is generally utilized to show farmers how much actually the sun is providing free of charge. So you're getting about one point two million ringgit Malaysia worth of light free of charge for just for two hundred days. So you can imagine. Oh, how how much the tropical countries benefit from using solar powered greenhouses as compared to the European countries? European country will have to use the electric electricity. So generally, they don't use the full range of electricity. They will use a certain spectrum. So they save energy. So if you look at it from a European Union perspective, the temperate countries, they will use about 200 to 300 watts per square meter so that's about one tenth of this but still the cost is high and plus you have the cost of the lamps so now all lighting is not good for plants okay if you see plants if you see the biochemistry of plants 
too little light will make them sick or weak but too much light also damages plants this is because the sunlight consists of ultraviolet radiation and when the sunlight hits the what is known as the photosynthetic center of the plant it starts producing free radicals so free radicals cause a breakdown of the photosynthetic or the photosystems and this reduces the photosynthetic efficiency so plants when they are grown in too strong light they will have lower productivity so solar greenhouses if you see they will either use a shade net or a film a opaque film this reduces the amount of light ambient or the incident light on the plant leaves and this in turn reduces the harmful effects of light so light is good until a certain level but beyond that it is harmful just as for us for example in kk the uv index is very high so if you spend too much time in the sun you will feel very tired because you are exposed to high levels of uv radiation because we are on the equator if you go out to the european countries the northern part of the china and all there will be a lower level of uv radiation also the radiation is very high at the higher altitudes okay so this is the thing about light too much of it can be bad so natural light is regulated in greenhouses by using polyfilm you'll you'll uh, if you are thinking as to why the greenhouses have polyfilm one of them is to keep the insects out keep the moisture in but also to keep the light out from the greenhouse because too much light is harmful to plants okay now advanced smart farming systems utilize solar energy but you can also use certain spectra of light and this is where your understanding again of molecular biology becomes important in terms of the smart farming okay. now light is composed of various uh, elements of the spectrum so you have violet indigo blue green yellow orange red as we learned in school we also have the ultraviolet infrared far infrared and near infrared now the plants do not utilize the whole spectrum okay for example research has shown that when seeds are germinating they require the infrared elements of the spectrum so far infrared and near infrared okay so they require those elements however when they start growing they use blue light for vegetative growth and red light for fruiting and flowering so if you expose a plant to its whole life of blue light most likely it will not flower because and it will also grow not grow well it requires a certain amount of red light for flowering and fruiting now this data has been gathered across the world from different systems and companies such as philips and osram that are european companies they have developed specific lamps for growth systems okay so let's look at the uh, the science behind the lighting for greenhouses so what happens is that you have two spectra which are absorbed by plants plants reflect green light which is because why their leaves are green so you have some plants which may be purple like for example the uh, certain uh, coleus and certain plants which have certain color so that color is because of not because of the photosynthetic elements is because of what is known as carotenoids so these carotenoids protect the plants from excessive light by absorbing the harmful radiation and converting it into an alternative reflected light so that's our carotenoid function but if you look at most plants which have green leaves they will absorb the blue and the red spectrum of light so what researchers have done or what commercial farmers have incorporated into their lighting system is only blue and red light they don't use the other light so when a plant is exposed to blue and red light the leaves don't appear to be green they appear to be black okay, black so because they are absorbing all the blue and all the red light so the green light is not there in that so green light is fundamentally not used by plants so why supply it when it's going to use an additional energy so what researchers have done is develop these lamps and now these are used commercially if you go to any farm smart farm which is not using solar energy you will see them using this led lamps now led is very efficient it's almost half as efficient as sunlight so you have for every watt of energy you provide to the led system it will provide sufficient of 45 lumens of light okay so that's like equivalent to half of what the sun will provide on a, under full conditions now with led lamps you can control the flowering and the vegetative growth of the plant for example when the plant is growing you provide more blue light and less red light 
when the plant begins to flower you increase the amount of the red light when it fruits you give it more red light and less blue light so you can control the growth of the plants by using smart farming approaches now companies like philips lighting from netherlands which is a pioneer in this kind of lamp systems they utilize these lights for grow out and they control the wavelengths by using sm uh, the smart farming approaches so they use the data from the plant growth to control the lights so the most commonly used light if you buy it from the uh, commercial shops is magenta magenta is an intermediate between red and blue so the light contains both red and blue lights but each one can be controlled in terms of the intensity now led lighting has an additional advantage it is cold if led lamps are not as hot as the conventional bulb or the fluorescent lamp so that in in term in turn affects the growth of the plants okay what i have not put in the lecture notes is some things about led which we observe in the lab uh, in the lab so leds are only uh, functional at 20 centimeters away from the source so for example if you are growing the tomato plant which is one meter tall and if you keep the shelf one meter high you have to keep adjusting the length of the light or you have to keep on raising up the plant and lowering it so it's about 20 centimeter away from the light after 20 centimeters the efficiency of led light is low so you won't have the entire plant illuminated okay that is why led systems are used generally for smaller plants such as the uh, lettuce celery chinese kale and curly kale and things like that so because of the efficiency of the led lamps okay so that's about the lighting so you have looked at lighting now we move on to culture media now when you plant a plant in the soil okay you will observe something almost all of us who grow plants will see this why do plants grow well in certain soil and they don't grow well in other soils okay you have the tanahitam uh, the black soil we always say tanahitam right and then you take other soil and then the plant will not grow well in that why does this happen okay okay please remember you can interrupt me at any time if you want to just turn on your mic and you can speak okay so you can interrupt me if you want to say anything okay so why do why do certain soils enable plants to grow well and certain soils do not this is primarily because of certain factors in the soil one is the ph of the soil and the important factor is the exchange capacity of the soil if you remember your lessons or your school uh, lessons on iron exchange, okay, iron exchange means certain media, you can take a resin and you can put certain uh, elements in like potassium, sodium, and they will absorb the element. And then after that, when you change the pH, they will release. Okay, that's the principle of iron exchange. Now, certain soils, when you add nitrogen fertilizer, they will uptake the nitrogen, but they will not release to the plant. In that case, the plant does not grow well. Certain soils, if you give them nitrogen, they will release it very slowly or they'll release it very fast. So that's the exchange capacity of soil. How much fertilizer can it absorb and how much can it release to the plant? So soil is very complex because you have to understand the soil. In fact, you have to have a like a degree or a PhD in soil science to understand which soil is good for which crops. And most of the soil is not useful for growing crops. For example, if you if you see the uh, soil in Sabah, if you, they open the hill, they cut the hills, you will see the soil is red, lateritic clay. That clay cannot be used for most of the commercial crops. Okay? You need to recondition it by adding organic compounds or the uh, like humic acid and things like that. So it's expensive to have good soil. So what precision farming does, it minimizes all the soils by using water. So no media is used in precision agriculture they use, only use uh, water and rock wool for support okay so this is what i have said you have used coir pith or rock wool coir pith is actually the coir from the coconut husk when you make the coconut husk you have from the coconut you get coir pith or the it's a kind of powdery residue now the reason why we don't use soil in precision uh, agriculture is because we cannot permit any kind of insects to enter into the system we don't want insects from the soil because soil is actually hosting nematodes different kinds of fungi and bacteria so if we introduce soil into the greenhouse there's a chance of infecting all the plants so this is why we use water okay now rooting of the plants in precision agriculture system is done by using rock wool okay if you open the old the older fridges right the refrigerators in between they use rock wool for insulation 
now of course they re replace with styrofoam and other advanced composite but this rock wool is used as a cheap insulating material means suppose something is cold in the grip fridge this rock wool will actually prevent the cold from going out by it's like a blanket okay now this rock wool is used extensively in the refrigeration industry to seal up all your refrigerators okay? but it has found application in the farming industry in the smart farming industry because you can plant the plants inside the rock wool cube okay so in rock wool is pathogen free you can sterilize it and you can plant so you get almost no pathogens in rock wool it's also neutral and you can adjust the ph and things like that so rock wool is an inert medium so you can use it for seeding and the next thing which we do is we shift to hydroponics system so once you germinate the plant in rock wool you no longer need the rock wool to grow the whole plant because rock wool is expensive you can't replace all the soil with rock wool so what you do is use hydroponic systems okay there are four systems which are used in hydroponics okay i'll go through them one by one i have utilized them all of them in the greenhouse so they have their disadvantages advantages so i'll tell you the practical uh, thing what have we observed in greenhouse over many years in when we are doing the work in the ipb greenhouse the kretke system is the first one dwc is deep water culture nft is nutrient film and the last is the dutch bucket okay we'll go through them one by one kretke actually is the word is actually from professor kretke so professor kretke is a professor from the hawaii uh, university who developed this system is the cheapest and the most efficient system in terms of usage because with kretke system you can just use a bucket and the roots will grow in the bucket with the fertilizer i will explain to you how it what happens then we have the dwc and nft these are actually good systems but they use a lot of energy electrical energy and then you have dutch bucket system which is also using a lot of energy and it's quite difficult to set up okay, let's look at kretke i'll just show you the uh, graphic okay okay now suppose you want to grow lettuce in a bottle like if you want to grow it in a soda bottle what is known as the 1.5 liter PET bottle in which you buy your Pepsi and all, it's, you can do it as well. The first thing you need to do is you need to black out the sides of the bottle because the roots, of course, you take a black paper and you wrap it around the bottle to prevent sunlight from going in as the roots won't grow. And then you just have a cap on top and you can plant your lettuce in the cap, a small lettuce uh, plant, and it just put fertilizer mixture inside the water. And you don't have to change that anymore. You can just leave it in your bottle and you can grow it. Okay, It's Kretke is as simple as that. So what happens in the Kretke system, as the plant grows, it starts using up the water. When the plant is fully grown, you'll have your lettuce, you just clip it off the top of the bottle. Okay, These things can be done. Uh, we have tried them in the lab to reproduce, uh, reproduce or replicate these systems, and it works perfectly well. So Kretke system does not use any uh, mechanical parts, nothing. It just uses a black container or a black coated container and the plant and a nutrient solution now the nutrient solution which is used in Kretke actually is a solution of macronutrient micronutrients and the uh, some growth promoters if needed so if you use if you are familiar with plant tissue culture from the earlier lecture you have heard of the murashige and skug medium which has all the macronutrient micronutrient that's all you need for the Kretke system of course in Kretke we don't use expensive stuff we can use the basic commercial fertilizer which you buy off the shelf so credit key system is very good no maintenance okay now in deep water culture is just like credit key but in deep water culture what happens we maintain the level of the water in the system throughout okay i tried to set up some deep dwc systems in the greenhouse before the pandemic they, the chili trees grow very well. They reached up to a height of around two meters. But during the pandemic, the aircon failed and we could not go in and everything was dead inside the greenhouse. You can see it. I have tried to start it off again. But in DWC, what we do is we use the level of water is similar, same, but we use aeration. So aeration is sim, sim, uh, the similar to the pump which you use for your aquarium. It's just an aquarium pump. But this, in the greenhouse, we use a heavy duty pump. And that pumps air into the system. So DWC is good because, again, the maintenance is low, but you need to invest in the energy for the pump. So you need to put in energy. And the second, what we observe practically in the DWC is if you provide too much oxygen, that harms the plant. So too much oxygen, if you add too much oxygen to the water, what happens is that certain minerals such as iron, magnesium, calcium will flocculate, which means that they will react with oxygen and they will form a precipitate. 
then the plants cannot absorb that. So DWC is having its disadvantages. The next one is the NFT. NFT is if you see the farms which are utilized, which are growing the lettuce and the uh, all the bok choy and all in the, uh, you know, if you find uh, online many of these farms, they use a tube, a pipe. So they grow the plants inside the pipe, inside the PVC pipe. Okay, this is actually called NFT system. In NFT system, the utilization of nutrient is very good. However, you have to invest in the energy. So you require a pump to keep the water flowing because in NFT, 24 hours a day, the water has to be flowing. If the water stops flowing, the plant will die. The roots won't get water and the plant will die. So again, you require to invest in the pumps. So these are energy, uh, energy systems which require energy. Now, many NFT systems use sensors for measuring pH. These sensors are put inside this uh, and then they add to the cost. In Kretke system, you don't have to use any sensor. You load it one time, you, you it's basically fill and forget. You load it one time and you're done. In NFT, you have to measure. So you have to measure the pH, electrical conductivity, and the other factor like, such as TDS, total dissolved solids. So it's expensive. And finally, you have the Dutch bucket system. Now this Dutch bucket system utilizes buckets, what are known as the, they're actually pots. They are called Dutch bucket because developed in Holland or Netherlands. So in this case, again, energy is involved. Again, you have to have sensors to measure all the uh, parameters. So this system is also costly because you have to invest in the cost setup of this system. It's uh, cost not cost effective okay, for a certain crop. If you are growing, for instance, strawberries or uh, some crops which are very expensive, you can use Dutch bucket. But overall, strawberries grow just as well in credit key systems. There's no difference, which we observed in the lab. Now, when we use all the systems, we have to be very careful with the fertilizer which we use. Okay, In the garden, you just go and you put some fertilizer, you buy those uh, pellet fertilizer, NPK, you say, you just put it in the garden and you forget. But in precision farming, you can't do that because if you play with the fertilizer concentration and if you manipulate certain parameters in certain way, you will have a complete loss of the entire farm because the entire uh, farm is recirculating the fertilizer. So you have to be careful with the NPK ratio, the macro and micronutrients. Okay, so in general, this is the rule of thumb in agriculture. So we apply it to precision farming as well. In the vegetative state, you have nitrogen should be high, which means that you have to give high amounts of ammonia and nit nitrate. NO3 and NH3. In the flowering stage, potassium is required. If you don't provide uh, potassium during the flowering stage, your flowers will fall off and you won't get any fruit. So that's why you give potassium. And in the fruiting stage, you have to give nitrogen and phosphorus. So if you don't give phosphorus to plants in the fruiting stage, <coughs> you will have a drop of the fruit. Okay, so NPK is very important to control throughout the growth of the plant. Now, suppose you're growing lettuce or green vegetables, you don't have to worry much about NPK because it's always using the standard fertilizer, 15, 15, 15, magnesium, calcium, and micronutrient. You don't have to worry about that. But if you're using tomatoes, uh, if you're growing tomatoes, you need to utilize the right fertilizer at the right stage. So in the early stage, you have high nitrogen, which means that you'll have a fertilizer which will be like 15, 10, 10. Then during the fertilizer flowering stage, you'll have about 15, 10, 15 and then during the fruiting stage you may have 15 30 15 okay for phosphorus now why this is required is because nitrogen is required to enable the leaves to grow but phosphorus is required for the synthesis of the dna and rna so when the plant is growing uh, at the fruiting stage it will produce a lot of dna and rna and it requires phosphorus to build up the phosphodiester background the backbones so you'll have a you'll have the phosphate sugars which are synthesized because of phosphorus. So if you don't provide phosphorus, obviously you won't get good fruit and the yield will be dropping. So many of us uh, who are doing farming, who are using fertilizer actually ignore this fact. And we use a lot of fertilizer. For example, I have seen farmers who utilize nitrogenous fertilizer during the flowering stage and then their flowers drop off because they have not utilized the correct agronomic practice. So it's good to learn about this when you do uh, the smart farming. Okay, carbon dioxide is a natural uh, gas which is pre present in the in the uh, atmosphere. So generally, in CO two in the room, if you take our CO two meter, we have one in the lab. 
it will show you about 400 parts per million. When there are human beings, too many human beings in the room, it will go up to maybe 450, 500 parts per million. That is when you will uh, feel sleepy. You will yawn. You will say, "Your sorry, this is something open up." Sorry. So you will have a problem when you have a high amount of carbon dioxide in the environment. So you will actually uh, feel like yawning because that's why when the CO2 increases, you will start yawning and feel, falling sleep, feeling sleepy. Okay, now in the greenhouse, what happens? Carbon dioxide is not harmful for the plants. Plants use it as a food source. Okay, so when you're growing plants in the greenhouse, if you if you have a good sunlight and you're having the carbon dioxide is all locked in, after the plants consume the carbon dioxide, in the middle of the day, around 12 o'clock, the carbon dioxide level will fall to maybe 150 to 200 parts per million. So when the carbon dioxide level drops, the plants actually suffocate. It's like taking away oxygen. So plants require CO2. So the plants slow down their growth. They are actually getting suffocated. So what uh, farmers do, and this is how they increase the yield, they provide higher amounts of CO2. So CO2 can be produced from different sources. So in general, in the USA, they utilize the CO2 produced from power plants. Okay, You have power plants that are producing uh, carbon dioxide, like the power producing plant. They actually filter the smoke and they separate the CO2 and pro provide it to the greenhouse. That's how they reduce the amount of CO2 in the environment and also use it to improve the productivity of the greenhouse. But in our situation, we can't actually use CO2 we can't, we, because CO2 production in, is expensive. You either have to have a power plant producing CO2, you should pr produce it within your greenhouse. So what is done in uh, the tropics is that they increase the airflow rate. So when the CO2 level drops, they keep on pumping more air, so you get the ambient CO2. Now, what was observed is that if you increase the CO2 level, double it, the plant yield will increase until a certain point after which CO2 becomes toxic to the plant. It's just like us. If we increase the oxygen level, after some time, the oxygen can kill you because too much oxygen will cause the, uh, the hypoxia in your blood and you'll have your metabolism will increase and you probably get sick. And so too much oxygen is also a bad thing. Okay, so CO2 is a bad thing for plants in the same case. Now, among plants, you have C3 and C4 plants. Okay. Now, C3 plants, fortunately, most of the vegetable crops are C3. So tomatoes, if you give uh, more CO2, the production will increase. This is why the smart farming is more efficient as compared to the terrestrial or the conventional farm. Because in a greenhouse, you can increase CO2, and then you get very high yield of tomato. If you do it in the natural, you can't do that. Because in the you can't keep pumping CO2 in the field. It will just go away. It will diffuse. But only C3 plants are affected or the impacted by CO2 levels. C4 plant, for example, sugarcane is C4. That one will not have much impact because of the four carbon atoms in the metabolic or the uh, biosynthetic pathway. So you, C3 is more sensitive to CO2. Now, if you see the growth, right, I've just uh, made a graphic. So 400 is OK. 800 is excellent for C, uh, C3 plants. But when it goes to 1,400, it becomes toxic. The CO2 is too high. The plant will die. Okay, you can do the experiment by using CO2 in the lab. You will see the results of that. In the lab, you can use actually use dry ice to produce CO2. The dry ice which comes with your packing. Take a little bit of dry ice, and you'll have CO2 from that dry ice. And if you put that dry ice in a greenhouse with a plant, a small greenhouse, you will see the effect. Too much CO2 is actually bad for the plant. Okay, now the pH is also a very important factor in the smart farming. So low pH is good for the availability of iron, but as the pH goes up, iron becomes not available to get sequestered in the in the solution. That is why most of us, when we make the even the murashige in school medium, we try and adjust the pH between six to seven so that all the elements are available in the in to the plant. Okay, so this is showing you the plant. So you can see here. Within this range, right, six to seven. Here you can see the range here. So here in this range, most of the elements are available. So six point five to seven. Okay. Beyond that, certain elements become not available. So alkaline conditions or acidic conditions favor the availability of iron, magnesium, and zinc. And alkaline condition favor the availability of molybdenum and calcium. So if your pH is not right, the element will be in the solution, but it will not be available to the plant. 
Okay, this is also one of the factors in soil acidity. So some plants prefer acidic soil, some plants prefer alkaline soil. Most plants prefer neutral soils. So because primarily because of the availability of the metal ions. Okay. If you remember or recall your chemistry, you will know that the metal ion is one of the uh, important elements of growth. So the pH is affecting the availability of the metal ion. So this one has to be monitored well in a smart farming system. So monitoring of pH is done using sensors. So you have your simple pH meter in your lab, which you use all the time. So in the smart farming system, you'll have multiple pH meters for multiple tanks. So if you have 10 systems, you'll have 10 pH meters. The data from the pH meter is not measured manually. It goes to a computer system. And the pH is monitored continuously. The other element of the uh, solution is EC. Okay, there are three elements actually, pH, electrical conductivity or EC, and there is the total dissolved solids. Okay, we don't look at TDS because TDS is a, is a function of EC. So you can estimate TDS by looking at EC. In fact, EC is also a function of pH. So all of these are related to each other. Now, what is electrical conductivity? Suppose I take water and I put an elect electrode inside, a positive, negative, and I try to measure how much current passes through, there'll be a resistance. But if you take your car battery, it's producing electricity because the conductivity is different. So in the car battery, you have your acid and your uh, lead plates, lead oxide. So they will produce electricity because of the uh, conductivity, because of the solution. Now, when you make a fertilizer solution for the, uh, for for the hydroponics, you have a problem with the conductivity. If you make the solution too salty, okay, the, it'll conduct more electricity. If you make it too light, it'll conduct less electricity. Now, the plants actually are very sensitive to the electrical conductivity because what's happening in the cell is actually, in the plant cells, is actually as similar to what happens in a battery. So you need to adjust the electrical conductivity by adjusting the ions in the solution. Now, electrical conductivity is very interesting because you can utilize it to manipulate the plant at a different growing stage. Okay, so electrical conductivity is similar to pH. It's measured using a pH meter. Okay, so this is a portable pH, uh, portable EC pH meter, but you get meters which are actually similar to your electrode and they will measure EC for you. So if you look in, the, if you check the pH meter in the lab, function there for pH and EC. So you can click. It's the same measure. It's a measure of the amount of the salts in the solution. So if your EC goes too high, the water becomes salty, the plant growth will be reduced. If the EC is too low, the plant will not grow. So you have to maintain the EC based on the particular plant. Okay. For example, if you're growing the savi and bok choy, they require higher EC as compared to tomato. Tomato and the uh, other plants will require the lower EC or else the, the fruit will not form. Okay. So these are the growth parameters which you look at in, in a smart farming system. We look at the lighting, the temperature, the carbon dioxide level, the growing medium, the nutrient, the pH and the EC, the nutrient deficiency and the output. Now this is the concept of smart farming when we are designing the computer systems. So the computer has to be designed to measure all these parameters. How it's done is I will show you in the subsequent slides. Okay. Now, nutrients and growth stages are very important. So, when, for instance, if you're growing the tomato plant, you will have different stages of nutrition. So, I have marked them in yellow and you can refer to them. Each one refers to a different stage in the plant. As I mentioned earlier, nitrogen is required during the early growing stages. However, phosphorus and potassium are required during the fruiting and flowering stages, respectively. You also have the uh, calcium and some of the elements which are required throughout at a fixed level, you cannot vary them or you'll have a problem with your productivity. Now, nutrient deficiencies are very easy to st uh, spot in plants. Normally what we require is a intelligent human being. Okay, so if you're an expert farmer in the early days, 20 years ago, you had to have an expert, He's, he or she is to look at the leaves and to say, oh, this one has no nitrogen, oh, there's magnesium deficiency purely by looking at the leaf. You can make out, today we don't use human beings anymore. You can actually download an e app on your phone from Yara Terra. You just go to your tomato plant or your 
uh, chili plant or your plant, and you just scan it with your camera, and it'll look at the leaf, and it'll tell you what's wrong with that plant. It'll say, oh, it's nutrient deficiency, and then immediately you'll get a ad to buy a fertilizer. <laughs> so that is the model which people follow. But we don't use apps in the conventional way in the smart farming system. You use it for your personal greenhouse. Now, in the smart farming system, optical sensors, which is basically cameras, will scan the plants periodically, means maybe once in a week or once in a day, and they will look at the leaves. Because the camera is high resolution, they will find out which of the plants have nutrient deficiencies purely by looking at the leaf and using an artificial intelligence algorithm to compare the leaf with the deficiency. OK, so this is, for example, these are deficient. For example, nitrogen deficiency is uh, observed in leaves. So if you're growing any plant, I use tomato because standard. So if you look at nitrogen deficiency tomato, the leaves will change from green to goldenish color. They'll have almost like a golden hue. So that means you are deficiency of nitrogen. This is a deficiency of phosphorus. OK, phosphorus is very easy to spot. If you take a, if you're growing tomatoes, you deplete phosphorus, you will have purplish. So golden is for nitrogen, purple leaves. The leaves become purple for phosphorus deficiencies because they try to assimilate carotenoids. Potassium deficiency is very also very common in plants. So you can see this at the edge. So if you look at the leaf, OK, lamina, what is known as the leaf lamina? Okay, so the leaf lamina, which is the edge of the leaf, starts getting deficient in potassium. Will have a this will have one second. I just adjust my pen. Okay, I'm trying to okay. so this is the leaf lamina. So when we when you have a potassium deficiency, the tips of the leaves, the ends of the leaves will actually become like this. They will get curled and they will become dry because potassium is required for the transport of the water. So if you don't have enough uh, potassium. Your solute transport is not there, so we'll have this particular phenomenon occurring. Iron deficiency is also observed in the veins, in the midribs. So if you see this part becoming white, the rest is green, but here you'll see the white part. So that's an indication of a iron deficiency. You see the midribs. So a normal leaf will be green. This will be white, so iron deficiency. And you have magnesium deficiency, which is this particular yellow color. So you'll see a yellow color at the margin of the leaf. Okay. Now, this is what we are taught when we do conventional uh, greenhouse observations. So now it is no longer required to be an expert in this area. You have your machine. So calcium deficiency is very evident. So if you have your tomato, your other plants, and the other fruits, and then you have this red, this black patch, okay. this is not caused by bacteria or virus or fungus. This is actually caused by the deficiency of calcium. It's called blossom and rot. After some time, of course, you will have fungus growing because the tissue has died. But if you see small dots of black on the base of the tomato, this is actually a deficiency of calcium. Okay? This is calcium, uh, blossom, and rot. Now, all of these data has to be fed into computers. So computers, now, if you have a computer, it will actually identify the, uh, the deficiency purely by looking at the leaf. Okay? So now in the system, what happens is that in a smart farming system, you have different sensors. We can't go into the electronics of the sensors now because it is beyond the scope of the lecture. But these are the basic sensors which I use in uh, artificial intelligence system in smart farming. So you have carbon dioxide sensor. Now, we have carbon dioxide sensor in the lab, but it's a manual sensor. We have to actually um, take it and monitor it. But in an artificial intelligence system, the carbon dioxide sensor will send an input directly to the central processing unit okay, via Wi-Fi, or it may be wired. It depends on the case. case may be. There's photo sensor, which measures the light. This is generally located in the greenhouse at the top of the plants. You have the ECPH and the TDS sensor. These are basically probes which sit in the tanks. You have the imaging system. Imaging system is utilized for the uh, assessment of the uh, nutrition nutrient deficiencies. And then you have the database. Now, the database refers to all the previous information. Now, you must remember in artificial intelligence systems, AI systems, they require prior training. Okay, Just as we go to school and get trained, this, you have to train the system. So the way the system is trained is by using a priori data. So data from other farms, data from uh, other uh, observations is trained into the system. Now, all of this. CPU produces an output. So it can manipulate light. 
So if, for example, if the sunlight drops, it can turn on artificial lighting. It can also change the lighting based on the growth stage by taking input from the imaging system. You can also use pumps for dosing. Pumps for dosing means when you have your pH changing, automatically the fermenter, you have, if, for example, you have seen in your lab, the fermenter, it has a pump for dosing. So if the pH drops, it will send a signal to the pump. It will pump in the nutrient or the acid or base, as the case may be. So the EC and the, uh, the pH will be adjusted using a pump automatically. You don't have to go and measure it and adjust it. And you also get from all this the data output to the operator, which means that the operator of the system, which is the manager of the system, will actually know how many plants are flowering, how many plants are fruiting, and how many plants are actually going to produce fruit in the next two to three months. So artificial intelligence is the is actually the game changer or the tool which enables you to run a smart farming system. This is why uh, it was not possible 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Now with the advances in technology and the lower cost, almost all of the farmers having a, a conventional farm can set up the uh, system with AI. Okay. Now what we use in AI is a system known as TensorFlow. TensorFlow is basically based on the input. So if you look at TensorFlow, it's, a, it's actually an artificial intelligence platform which you program into the CPU. And TensorFlow is very unique because it can enable you to identify patterns. Okay, Suppose you showed uh, TensorFlow or you programmed the TensorFlow with the different leaf images I showed you earlier. I said, if, if the photograph or the image has this, for example, nitrogen deficiency, the symptom will be, this will be the manifestation or the symptom is this. So the TensorFlow will automatically scan. It will take a photograph of the greenhouse using the imaging system. It will pick up all the input from the pictures and it will do a scan, high resolution scanning of the leaves. And it will tell you how many plants are actually having nitrogen deficiency, how many are having phosphorus and potassium. And you can actually manipulate your fertilizer mixture purely by looking at the data from TensorFlow. Now, TensorFlow is open source. You can download it or you can run it. It's from Google. You can run it on your browser as well. Okay, it's an interesting program. It's very uh, easy to use because the code is actually shared between different uh, users. So if you all are interested in um, AI, you look at TensorFlow in the Google uh, ecosystem, the Google, the Google workspace. Okay. Now that you know all these things about lighting and uh, artificial intelligence and everything else, we come down to the final part is how will you design a system for your precision farm? How will you, supp suppose I gave you uh, 100,000 ringgit or 1 million ringgit Malaysia, how will you design a system? So there is a question with, with not only a system, but a system which will create a profit. That's the point which should be taken, the take home message for this particular module. So how will you design the system? Okay. So when you, for example, if you gave me uh, a certain amount of money, X amounts of uh, investment, I will straight away start looking at different factors. But the first factor I will look at is not all those within the system itself. I will look at what is known as market demand. Okay. This is the very important entrepreneur aspect that's why many of the scientists we are we are from science field we actually fail as entrepreneur because we don't look at the factor which is market demand you may be very good in all the technical the ai everything else if you don't look at market demand everything else is of no value okay so when you look at market demand you should look at the target crop for example see i'm growing for example if i'm in japan i will definitely grow in for crops which are high value and costing uh, more for the market, which is the uh, sushi market, for example. If you're in Singapore, you can also do that. You can go in for the high value target crop. But if you're in Sabah, what will you do? You can't grow in the, you can't grow those high value crops because first of all, because of the pandemic, the tourism industry is down. So we can't go for the high value target crops. But maybe after recovery, you can go in for high value crops such as herbs. Herbs grow very well in the uh, climate control system. You have basil, oregano, uh, thyme, Majoram, these are all herbs, and they can grow very easily in the smart farming systems using artificial lighting. And because their cost is very high, you can actually sell them at a profit. Okay, so you look at the target crop itself, then the cropping cycle. Okay, now if you're growing uh, leafy vegetables in the farm, like lettuce and um, 
pak cho you know the cropping cycle is very low it's short time so within uh, 30 days 60 days 45 days you can actually uh, get a crop so usually pak cho about 60 days we have tried in the lab so it's 45 to 60 days you get a marketable crop so you have to look at the major and minor my micro minor nutrients which is the major uh, macro and micro nutrients so you have to look at this because the cost of the fertilizer again is the factor you can't use expensive fertilizer okay so you have to look at the costing light intensity so can you increase the production of the uh, crops by using artificial light uh, in the greenhouse when we tested yes the productivity increases when you use artificial light but the, the taste is different okay, so these are factors which you have to see c3 or c4 plant so c3 plant means you can provide co2 c4 plant means it doesn't have much impact on the production so fortunately most of the plants which are produced in greenhouse are c3 plants then the greenhouse setup is important how we set it up the costing for that and the system for what kind of system do you use for monitoring the process okay nowadays you have ready made systems you can buy the program for ph monitoring and dosing okay it costs about 5000 to 6000 ringgit malaysia for the system so this system will have you will have to have one tank which a fertilizer which is pumped throughout and then you have probes so you have a probe for the ph ec temperature tds that will send the input to the system and the system will then use a pump to add ph in terms of the acid and alkali so these systems are available in malaysia already okay we also have the development of systems which are required like such as the uh, mechanical systems you can buy them which will do the robotics work for i'll go into that in the next slides okay so one of the if you are if you are interested in starting smart farming it's important to start off with leafy vegetable crops so leafy vegetable crops are those crops which are grown for their leaves so in this case the you eat the entire plant except the root the root is trimmed and thrown away now in terms of efficiency leafy crops have more return on investment because you're eating the whole plant if you're growing a tomato or a or a brinjal you have to throw away about 40% of the plant has to be thrown away because there's the leaves and and the stem in the case of leafy crops you have you can eat the leaf now with leafy crops you have to be careful with the market demand now there is a over production of certain leafy crops so market demand is lower however you have a advantage with smart farming because it's considered non uh, pesticide use so that's the usp or the marketing point so all the smart farm will say we don't use pesticides so consumers buy that of course you must remember technically uh, precision farming is not organic you can't do organic farming in a precision farming system because organic farming will give very low yield the okay, organic crops so the profit will be lower with organic crops so leafy crops are the uh, crop of choice what i've shown you in the background is something known as kale k a l e curly kale so this is a crop which is now having some medicinal value so it's having a high value in the market but again for kale it's not a general crop you have to find specific consumers who want that crop okay not everyone eats this because it's a little bit expensive for fruit bearing crops you can only uh, do the crop which for which you have a market again if you did tomatoes for example in saba using the the smart farming system the cost of the production will be too high as compared to the natural tomatoes unless you have people who are very specific for their uh, market demand for example no pesticide use then you can market that at a higher price so to give you an uh, idea right the rule of the thumb if you want to produce tomatoes in smart farming system and if you want to make a profit in kk for example the price of the tomatoes should be uh, approximately 8 6 to 8 ringgit malaysia per kilogram okay if you have that price range it's viable but if the price range of tomato drops below 6 ringgit the system becomes inefficient you can it's too expensive it will be the production cost will be higher than the marketable cost in the case of lettuce and the other green crops you have to have around 10 8 to 10 ringgit per kilogram in order to break even if you go below 6 ringgit or below 8 ringgit your profit will drop 
always remember that the uh, production is also based on the volume or the amount of crops that you actually grow. Okay, so there are certain things which are available. Of course, this is actually farm bot, and these are experimental robots. Okay, these if you can you can actually visit the farm bot website. There's a website for this, and this farm bot is actually a robot which you can build yourself, and it will do almost all the of the operations of farming. So, for example, if you are planting seeds, you, you can set up a program. You can program with the computer, and you can do a farming. You can do a seed planting operation using farm bot. Now, this farm bot is used in many of the universities in the US for training uh, students to in robotics in smart farming. Okay, you can go to the farm bot website. You can actually download the farm bot uh, software, and you can also download the entire plan and you can screen print. Sorry, 3D print it. You know, you have a 3D printing machine. You can 3D print many of the components using a 3D printer, and you can build a farm bot yourself. So they have given it free of charge the plan. However, if you buy the farm bot from the company, uh, it costs around six thousand US dollars okay, for the farm bot. I think around that much. So the farm bot is one of the innovations made for, uh, you know, for the open source. You know, the open source community it means people who don't want to, uh, like, uh, how do you say, buy the expensive stuff. So farm bot is open source. All the plans are available, and you can make your own farm bot. Okay, so let's summarize what we have learned today. Precision farming is the only solution which is available for a growing population. As I have mentioned to you earlier, the arable land on the planet is only 29%, and almost half of it is used for the agriculture, and even a smaller amount is used for the crops which we eat. So if you are growing, most of the uh, agricultural land is used for growing feed for cattle. And for example, the cows, the chicken, and then that's basically not going to help us in the future. So maybe in the future, we'll have synthetic meat, which is meat produced in the laboratory. Uh, already companies have made uh, tissue culture uh, steak for your burgers. So things like that are being developed. So that may be the future of the meat industry. But the meat industry is a major reason why our crops are getting uh, pushed out from the market. Now, in the agricultural industry, point number two is the efficient usage of resources. So the smart farming ensures that all resources are utilized efficiently. The pollution is minimum. There's no runoff. And you have artificial intelligence. So that enables you to minimize labor, and you don't have to have expertise. So as time goes by, you'll, you'll see a trend. All the people who call themselves expert today will be disappearing as artificial intelligence takes over their jobs. Okay, so be prepared for five to ten years down. There won't be need for experts anymore because the systems, the computer system will have become so intelligent, it will eliminate the need for experts. So you only will have an advantage if you know how to use the system. That is uh, the thing what we will see in the future. And what we can do as molecular biologists is to study the system in terms of the responses to fertilizer and develop hybrids which are adapted to precision farming platforms. For example, see the conventional tomato seeds are designed for growing in the soil. When you grow them in hydroponic systems, you can't really get good yield. So companies in the Netherlands and the European Union, the, actually, I refer to Netherlands because the Dutch, right, in the which is the Holland. Uh, the European Union countries, they're actually the leaders in this. They have developed special tomatoes, lettuce, which can grow in hydroponic systems more efficiently than soil, purely by doing breeding and uh, genetic engineering. So that's the basis for the smart farming lecture. So in this lecture, because we cannot cover all the elements, for example, the programming with the computers, for example, using TensorFlow, I can't cover it in the scope of this lecture. So the purpose of the lecture is to introduce you to the concept and to basically uh, enable you to imagine these things and maybe develop them as part of your entrepreneurship exercise. OK, so that brings us to the end of the presentation. OK, if you want anything to discuss, anything you want me to explain, you can please proceed. I'm stopping the recording.